what this is, huh? I'd like to give you a little something, a token of our appreciation. Hey, is that a bottle of whiskey? Shh. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. We appreciate all you do. Well, thank you. No. <laughs> By the way, did you, how many of you caught the violins he put in there? Oh, you guys, you, I hope you caught. I caught it. There were violins in that last song. That was killer. I, for me, it was. Maybe you guys are. You're all good stuff. Oh, thank you. Why you filled it up? Do I look thirsty? <laughs> I'm going to put it over here. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, fall is definitely here. My tree in my front yard is a beautiful red. That's, I don't, I think it's funny that I never get tired of those certain things, you know, like yeah. trees changing, the mood. We get it pretty good. Um, next week is family feast. Let's, uh, let's plan on doing that. Let's, uh, plan on inviting people. By the way, did you all see we have a superhero at church today? <laughs> Jace has got a great costume. Look at him. <laughs> I love it. I should have dressed up in something like that. It looks better on him, though. Um, so we're doing Family Feast next week. Don't forget. Now, I believe, and I'm asking, but I think, are we good to go now with the windows? Is that, yeah. we're good to go? We're good? Yeah, we lost her. It's excellent. Martin says that we still have the carpet available. It just has to get over here. I'm going to be taking care of that hopefully this week. Uh, we have to give the people a tax letter stating that they donated. And I've been talking to Brad about that. So we may have a roll of carpet just sitting at the back room until it gets installed, but at least it'll be here. So there are, you know, it's getting there slowly but surely. I, I do think, um, and we'll... Uh, get going here in a second. We've already been prayed in. I do think God is doing some interesting things. I know I've thought about it for some time now, and it's the reason why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching right now. Uh, there are some things that need to be put into place in this ministry structure that haven't been there. Uh, and, and I think it's a good thing. So I look at things from the standpoint of, uh, you know, who's coming, who's committed, you know, and what are we going to do next? And I think that in the brilliance of God, he's developing it out. So we grow like this instead of what I've seen happen in a lot of churches where it goes from here to 60 and then all of a sudden, you know, so slower is better. Um, I've been finding it fascinating watching and listening to other pastors talk about how church was prior to COVID and how it is now. And there definitely is a shift. There really has been a shift. And amazingly enough, you know, you, and this isn't the sermon yet, you look at it as being um, a negative. But if you think for a minute, look how woke up we are, how much we've, had to really look at things now and examine ourselves. There's been this uh, almost a nudging or a jostling that God did with the planet in reference to saying, hey, you all don't have it figured out as well as you think you do. I could uh, allow this, you know, and now you've got to, that's the way I've been seeing it. It's like, okay, Lord, you're teaching me to think maybe where I've been lazy in my thinking. So we got family feast, we've got the windows, we've got the carpet. We're going to be back in Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 1. We're only going to do verse 1 again. Again, what most people don't know about Paul writing here in Titus, it's very compact. So when you go to open it, it goes, and there's just so much in it. Uh, the goal today is for me to help you understand what motivates Paul why he wrote what he wrote, why he repeated certain things so many times. Uh, my hope is, is that you uh, catch the wave, let's say, 
of what Paul is trying to get across. All right, so take me to, oh, there it is, Titus 1. All I want you to notice uh, is the very first things he says in this verse. The rest of it we're going to leave. I told you last Sunday that verse 1 to verse 4 is all one sentence in the Greek. It is also here, but Paul is servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Stop there. That's what I want to develop out. It is probably the strongest statement that Paul makes in reference to himself and how he views ministry. And it is the model that each and every one of us should have. And I told you last week the word servant there is the strongest word in the Greek for a slave, a full-blown slave, the word doulos, meaning he is fully committed. Now, here's the thing that people struggle with, and it's just our nature. It's not evil. It's just how we function. It's interesting. Commitment to what? He tells you. He's willing to do whatever God has instructed him to do in reference to Jesus, the Messiah, Christ. Apostle means messenger or proclaimer. So Paul says, I am fully committed to God and the proclamation of Jesus, the Messiah. Christ, which means Messiah. Fully committed, do loss. Now, that's not a moderate term. Like I said, that is a very serious, sincere statement of commitment to Christ, not to a church, not to a pastor, not to yourself. This is an individual who has said, my life is not mine. I am a slave. Uh, You all well know that a bond servant was a willful slave. People don't like the word slave because they're not looking at it from the context of this point in history. But a willful committed a by choice choosing to be a slave is what doulos means. Uh, Years ago, uh, there was an illustration, and you may all know it by now, of what it is going, what's going on when they knight somebody and they take the sword and they tap the shoulders of the knight. It literally means that his head has been severed, which means his whole life now belongs to the monarchy, and his thoughts don't matter. What matters is he is to serve the king with his whole existence. It's what Paul is saying. And the hardest part about this is because we're human and we're material and we need material to survive and exist and we find our pleasure from material, it's in our nature to neglect the spiritual in our lives. And it's in our nature to think that material need supersedes spiritual need. But it's exactly the opposite. But because we are so dominantly in a physical world and physical form, we we don't realize that the spiritual aspect of our existence is extremely critical. You're seeing that now in your society. In a crisis, those that understand the spiritual issue would be more involved in serving God the King than they would worrying about whether or not they're going to resolve you know, all of the world issues. They would be more focused about their spiritual life, but you don't see that. Um, they're measuring all the time uh, the things that are happening in the churches right now. Uh, David Jeremiah made a statement the other day 
that sitting on your couch at home in your pajamas listening to a sermon is not fellowshipping with believers, which you are actually commanded to do. Because we don't understand that that level of commitment is what's required for your life to function the way God intends your life to function. So it's looking at commitment from the standpoint of to Christ. It's not just commitment to something or things. It's, it's a commitment to Christ. Your reason for being in a church is not to necessarily be here every Sunday, even though that identifies your commitment. So if you think about it, if you're committed to Christ, then that means you're committed to Christ's people, which means you're also committed to the mission, which is to make disciples. Again, Paul, let's use the word committed, fully committed servant of God and a proclaimer, a messenger of Jesus, the Messiah, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. That's you if you're a Christian. The necessity of you living your life for that mission. And look at the next part of it and their knowledge of truth. This is key, which accords with godliness. That message of Jesus has to be in line with what it is to be Christ-like, godliness. That's the only way it works. So let me give you some stuff off my notes here. Um, Paul, in this statement that he's making, by the way, this isn't a boast. Interestingly enough, all he's trying to say to you by saying an apostle is that he has authority. Now, you have authority also as believers. If it were a boast that he's trying to say, well, I'm an apostle, why didn't he include all of his other credentials? Well, he didn't because it's not about his credentials here. It's about the authority he's been given by God because he was saved by God for the purpose of being a proclaimer of who Jesus Christ is in the world. To be a proclaimer of the truth. And it's in accord with godliness, meaning the goal is to be accurate. Let me give you an example. Uh, this is not my example. I got this from someone else. But it says, if I have a slave, and he may be the lowest slave in my stable of slaves, he may, he may be the very bottom guy on the totem pole, if you will. And I say to my slave, I want you to go across town, and I want you to take this message to a man over there. That slave then becomes my apostle. It doesn't carry any more dignity than that. The dignity is in the authority of the one who sent the messenger, not in the messenger. There's no inherent dignity in being a messenger of Jesus Christ, except the dignity of the task itself, based upon the authority of the Lord who gave the task. Isn't that a great statement? It really is that way. Your authority is given to you by your master. Uh, it would be like I've said before, Caesar's slaves were known by the people in the city that Caesar lived in. So when they walked down the street, they were treated as if they were Caesar's personal property. They were respected as being the slaves of Caesar. It's really history. You didn't mess with them. Why? Because the one who sent them was Caesar. Pretty simple. The same thing applies to you as believers. If you're a Christian, you need to be bold in the message that you are called to deliver by your king. As a matter of fact, he requires you to deliver this message. It's not an option. And again, the biggest problem we have is we don't know what we're really committed to. 
I've found that, for instance, in a lot of churches over the years, because I grew up in the church, that a lot of the frustration that occurs in a church is because the commitment is in the wrong place or the commitment level is not there. One foot in, one foot out the door. One moment you say, well, if they don't live up to what I want, I can leave and I'll just leave and I'll go to a church down the street. Well, that's the mistake. You're not committed to anything at that point. You're only committed to yourself. But a person who's committed to serving Christ isn't in a church building simply to be entertained by a pastor and a band. You go to that church because you feel your master sent you to that church to be a proclaimer of Christ, to edify the saints. You don't go for any other reason. If you're here for any other reason, you need to go home. <laughs> but if you understand that I am here to serve my master, my king, Jesus, and proclaim and engage in propagating that truth and that worship, then you're here for the right reason. And you'll find that if your motive is to really serve Christ, then he will give you, and everybody gets this scripture wrong. It's funny to me. He will give you the desires of your heart. People think that that statement is a statement of, well, if you, you, know, you ask, God will give you the desires of your heart, what you want. No. He will establish you. He will establish right desires in you. He will give you the desires of your heart. He will establish that from that obedience, blessing. From that right motive, blessing. Are you tracking with me? Okay. You're slaves. To put it bluntly, and I'm going to prove that to you. I want to go to Acts 20, please, verse 24. But I do not account my life of any value. This is Paul. Nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Do you see the commitment? Do you see what he is convinced of? Each person that's a believer has been given a mission and a calling. The problem we have is the level we're willing to commit our life to that commissioning and calling that God has given us. No value. It's not even an interest to him, he says. He proved it also by being shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, multiple times, going into environments where he knew going there would probably get him killed. But he was committed to his mission, what he was sent to do. Now, I've talked to you a little bit about Francis Chan, who's a phenomenal preacher. But he left the United States because the average American Christian is not this committed. And he went to China, where people are being maimed, crippled, arms cut off. I mean, bad, bad stuff happening to these people. And Francis Chan happened to run into some of them, and he realized that in America we were obsessed with our own pleasure and our own desires, and he wanted to go be with Christians who saw this as being how you live your Christian life. That's Francis calling me now. Think about it. Americans don't want to think about it. I don't. I'm honest. I like my comfort. I really do. I like it that I get to eat what I eat. And that's really a problem right now. Because the holidays are coming and I'm already fatter ahead of the game. So I've got to do this major crash diet course. But I love my comfort. I love my comfort. I woke up last night. My wife made an apple pie. And I usually don't eat pies and cakes, but man, I wanted to eat this apple pie. And it was 10 o'clock at night. And I'm I didn't do it. 
I didn't do it, but think about it. I wanted that so bad. Now, in America, we have that mindset. As a matter of fact, if you look at Revelation where it talks about one of the things that's supposed to happen in the plague, the plagues, one of them is destroy these things, but don't touch the oil and the wine. I should have pulled that verse up, but it just popped in my head. But don't touch the oil and the wine. Do you know what that's referring to? The people in that last period of the history of this planet will not give up their luxuries even though they are having to struggle just to buy daily food. They won't give up their luxuries. And I've been making my own observation. Gas is $3 and something a gallon around here. Okay, food has astronomically gone up. So we have an increase in expenses. And I'm watching people who barely make enough money not realizing that they need to make further adjustments, but they just keep doing what they've always done. What? I'll just keep spending what I've got. It doesn't matter. I'll, you know, no, you need to understand that you can't, you can't get caught up in that inertia. <clears throat> this is how you should think as a Christian. My resources... And I'm not, this is not give me money sermon, so don't think that. <laughs> but my resources, my thoughts, my time, my heart should be slave like in commitment to Christ. Your ministry is unique. It's not like mine, unless you have this spiritual gifts that I've got, which is teaching, preaching. Your gift may be simply mercy, it may be the gift of prayer, it may be, but whatever gift God has given you. You should be thinking in terms of being as sacrificial with that gift as you can. It may be encouraging. The gift of encouragement is one of the gifts. Encouraging people to keep going, loving on them, all that, all that matters. That's why you can't sit at home and watch sermons on TV and be doing the mission. It's impossible. You're only serving yourself in that moment. You know, I know some pastors that have turned off broadcasting because it's become a problem. And it's because the American, that's all I know, Christian has got this mindset that I don't really have to commit fully. I'm saved. I got my get out of jail free card. That's all that matters to me. And then they just go on their life just like it's always been. <clears throat> Take me to Romans 6, 22, please, Alan. This is what happened when you were saved, if you are saved. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become a slave of God or slaves of God. Now, he's not saying that cavalier. He's serious. The fruit you get leads to sanctification. And it ends in eternal life. Now, sanctification, you know what that is? Simple word. It means that because you have been saved... Freed from sin, meaning you're free to not sin anymore because of the fact that he died for you. And you were bought as a price at a price, which was the death of his son, Christ. So you are now one of his, a slave. You were purchased from death into life. Sanctification means that in your life, please do not miss this, that in your life there should be some growth of holiness. You should be conforming to being more like Christ. If there is no change occurring in your life and you are living just like you've lived for years and you're not growing in your relationship to Christ and to a body of believers, I question whether or not you really made a decision for Christ. I really do. I don't know. But... If you're still living like the world and there isn't changes happening or a deeper desire for holiness, something's wrong in your sanctification process. You may not understand what you think you understand about Scripture. You may not understand what salvation's purpose was. It is to conform you to be like Christ. That wasn't just some religious statement someone made. You were saved to be conformed, to be like Christ. 
And yes, he'll do it. He'll do it, but guess what? He'll do it dragging you down the road the whole way. And then you die and get to heaven, and he says, well, you, now you're going to be like me. Or you're walking some of the way. And some people walk it better than others. But if you've been a Christian for years, and you're still having to be drug to be like Christ, something is wrong. Something's wrong. Go ahead and take me to Philippians 2, please. Paul gives you a view of what things should look like. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, note the word participation, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Stop right there for a minute. Whose mind? Ours? See, because a lot of churches think in terms of denominationalism. Well, are you a Baptist? Well, yeah, I'm a Baptist. Well, that means you believe this, 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 this. Well, if somebody says to me, what are you? And I say, I'm a Christian. Then that means my mind is lining up with Christ's mind. Why? Because he's the head of the church. He's the guy in charge. So if your ministry or your life is not lining up with the mind of Christ, there's a problem. Look what he says. Having the same love, well, that means what Christ defines as being love. What the Trinity defines as true love. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, of course, in line with God and what he says. Not what you want, what he says. Because he's the one that owns you, right? Nobody would want a slave who walks down the street after you give him a message. Say, look, I want you to go do this. And the slave says, okay, you're my master. And they go down the street and they do everything the opposite of what their master instructed them to do. What would he do? What would you do? Are you kidding me? You went down the street and you made me look like garbage. Because, number one, you demonstrated that you don't respect me. Number two, you did everything I told you not to do, which now has messed up all of these things that could have been in play, and you've created issue for me. So now Hebrews 12 comes into play, which is God disciplines you like sons. You have to be disciplined. But look at it. So if there's any encouragement, he's saying, look, pay attention to this. Go to the next one now. Do nothing from rivalry. Or conceit, but in humility, counting others more significant than yourselves. Now, he's going to tell you this in the text as we go through it. But what did Jesus do? This is pretty much, they might as well tack his name on all that's being said here. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. How can you do that when you're not attending a body of believers and you're sitting at home? You're you're isolated. Do you know that in the secular psychology area of the world right now, one of the dominant issues that they say is in play right now is we are not connecting? Psychologically, it's causing major issues because we're not connecting. We're so divided on this planet now. Over issue after issue after issue, Who should be demonstrating unity of mind in a community? The church, under Christ's mind, leadership, training, teaching. That's what we should represent, especially in a society like this one. And instead, we're being sucked into it. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Notice that. Jesus' whole focus, that just blows my mind. You have the most powerful existing being who will ever be, who has known for his whole existence nothing but perfect perfection and glorification of who he is. He's known nothing else but that. A willingness to be poured out, 
lose that and step into the world of us losers to give us an opportunity to be freed from sin and have life. Why wouldn't you want to sell yourself out to an individual like that? Who would do that? I, I mean, I don't know anybody. And then for him to say repeatedly, what's mine is yours now. All you have to do is accept what I'm doing for you. Well, what are you going to do for me, Jesus? I'm going to actually go not physically die. That's not the big issue. Everybody looks at him dying on that cross. They are missing it. That's nothing. The fact that he was temporarily separated from God was everything. And every single sin of every human being, he paid the price for. You have no idea. You will never comprehend that. You can't even handle dealing with your own sin, let alone the world through all of history. And he took the full wrath of God on himself and didn't even have to do it so you could have an opportunity to have what he is and has. That should blow your mind. It should make you want to just beg for that relationship. It should make you want to hang out with him 24-7, I would think. I mean, if somebody saves my life, I'm going to give them a lot of respect, especially if they lost theirs to save mine. Think about it. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, a full and complete submitted servant of God the Father. Even death on the cross. Therefore, now he's speaking to us. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. What should we be doing in our lives? What should be the attitude of our lives on a continual basis? Every knee should bow. You either do it willfully or you're forced to do it. But you're going to bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. Next. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, obedience should be an issue in your life. It should be a concern. So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation, meaning live it out. Let it take hold. Let it be evident in your life. Let it be proven by your actions and your words that you are truly a servant of the living God. With fear and trembling, there's the missing element with most of us. We don't take our salvation serious enough. He made it so easy for you to have eternal life that you have forgotten that you became a product of his And he has called you specifically to do a work. We should be working out our salvation. That's just, that's simple. We should be actively doing what we've been called to do. It's that simple. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good. Remember I said he gives you the desires of your heart. He gives to you. To the will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run, notice this, in vain or labor in vain. Don't lose that in vain. We're going to talk about that a little. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. I'm willing to die for this. That's what he's saying. And he's telling these guys, you need to be too. You need to have the same mind. You need to live for Christ. You need to sacrifice for Christ. The goal is that kingdom. The goal is to be used by God for the saving of people that will die in their sin if you are failing to do what he has gifted you to do and called you to do. It's that simple. 
And I, I love it how many people try to find excuses to not do the work. <laughs> it's, it's unreal. But please take this serious. In vain. That's the word we want to focus on. Take me to 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Take me to Galatians 4, 7 through 11. So you are no longer a slave, meaning a slave to sin. Okay? You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have become to be, have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose, whose slaves you want to be once more? Do you want to go back into this? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. You know what vain simply means in these texts? A waste of time. Paul is saying to these churches, I'm hoping that what I've been teaching you wasn't a waste of time. That you actually are taking what I've been teaching you with the authority that God had given him as a leader and applying it in your life and that I'm not just wasting my time teaching you the truths. That's what he's saying. And you have to look at your own lives. How much have you been taught about the word of God over your life time? And how much has it actually changed your life? Or how much are you still like the world just claiming that you're a Christian? Was Paul's work in vain? Was it just a waste of his time? I mean, as I sat and read these scriptures to write this sermon up, I consciously was saying to him, even though he didn't hear me or anything, I don't want you to waste your time on me. I want to read what you've given me here. Lord, and I, I want to see that I want to understand what Paul's telling me. I don't want it to be a waste of his time. I want to read Philippians. I want to read Titus, Timothy. I want to read all those letters he wrote, and I don't want his time to be wasted on me. And you should think the same way. But on top of that, I don't want the sacrifice of Christ that was made for me to be wasted either, to where I produce nothing for him in return for the graciousness that he offered me. I don't think we think about our spiritual conditions enough. We don't. And we're doing a disservice to the guys that did the work before us. And we're doing a disservice to the ones that come after us. Now think about that. I mean, we're here right now at this point in history for the purpose, because you are saved, if you are, for the purpose of fulfilling the will and the plan of God in the lives of people on this planet. People are the number one commodity. And I swear we spend more time worrying about other things. A waste of time. And the question is, and the statements he makes, is if you even believe. I know a lot of people that will tell you they're Christians, but their life represents nothing of Christ. I don't buy it. Now, there's people that are going to say, I'm preaching lordship salvation, which is a whole other topic. John MacArthur was accused of that because he wrote a book. I'm, not, I'm preaching absolutely that. You can't tell me. Now, I don't, now, again, salvation's God's business, but you can't tell me that a person can say, I'm a Christian, and continue on in deliberate, willful disobedience 
I understand falling off your horse. I understand struggling with addictions and things like that. I understand that. But what is motivating you? I mean, what is, you know, don't, don't tell me you love somebody and I never, ever, ever see you express love for them. You never spend time with them. You never talk about them. And what I see is the opposite, <clears throat> where all you're doing is <clears throat> sinning and choking up. I mean, think for a minute. Simply because I come up to you and say, hey, are you a Christian? You go, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, but there's nothing there. You won't go to church. You don't pray. You don't seek God. The only time you seek God is when you want something from him. <clears throat> You're not seeking him for the purpose of glorifying him. <clears throat> don't tell me you're a Christian. And that's what scares me. Because I know so many people that will tell you they're Christians and there's nothing there. Nothing there. No change. No movement. Just, I'm just going to do what I've always done. But hey, yeah, I'm a Christian. I got my get out of jail free card. That should scare you about people that are in your life that you allow to continue in a behavior or lifestyle that is destroying them. You need to throw the gospel at them. I don't care how mad they get at you. I don't care that you feel obnoxious. You need to say to that individual, you're going to hell more than likely because you're rejecting the very salvation you claim you believe. And you know what I hear all the time? That I'm being judgmental and unkind. Really? I'm scared for somebody's life because they won't do what they need to do. You know what's really sad about it to me? Is how many people want to argue with me about the truth of the word of God and live in their swill, and they know they have a lousy life going on, and they know they're not happy, and they know things are broken, but they will not even move an inch towards Jesus. It's money. I need to win the lottery. That'll fix my life. Really? Or a political movement? No. The answer lies within sanctification. I am a Christian. I was bought at a price. I now serve a king. And what that king instructs me to do, I will do to the best of my ability. That's what this is all about. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> you need to understand this. Please do not miss this. This is a quote. True believers or even a church, let's say. Disunity, meaning not unified under God's control, Jesus' commands, among believers frustrates God's desires and his purpose or his provision of grace. Any disobedience to God's will in your life or in a church frustrates his grace. You actually are stopping him from doing things that he desires to do because of your rebellion. Your motives of inactions take control, and you're shutting the door. And then you wonder why things aren't getting better in your life, but the truth of the matter is you're not pursuing righteousness. You're not pursuing obedience. So we've got a people that are in a cycle of saying, please, God, fix this. Please, God, fix this. Please, God, fix this. And God's going, then do what I tell you. Do what I tell you. Do what I tell you. No, please, God, fix it. And it's just a continual battle, and God's just sitting, look, I'm, I'm telling you what you want me to fix, I'll fix if you simply do it the way I've told you to do it. You can't pour sugar in a gas tank. It won't work. All genuine spirit-filled Christians, let me say it again, all genuine spirit-filled Christians, and I mean being spirit-led, because a Christian can quench the spirit. You can shut him down in your life. You're still saved, but you shut down his instruction. You shut down your ability to understand correctly. You can quench the Holy Spirit. All genuine spirit-filled Christians see themselves as being under divine authority. It's not your opinion. If you are filled by the Holy Spirit and you're walking in the Spirit, you understand you are under the divine authority of God. And you have an obligation 
to let him have that authority. Now, if you choose to resist it, he'll shut you down. He'll let you just live. Okay. Whatever he does to accomplish, to deal with you in that, but you've shut down what he's offering to you in abundance, which is knowledge of him, knowledge of the truth, the ability to go before him in prayer with absolute confidence in his grace and his mercy and his love for us. But you shut that Holy Spirit down, you can't hear anymore. And I know that if each and every one of you would go sit by yourself and think about it, and really think about it, you would recall that there have been moments, if you're not in it even right now, where you're not hearing him anymore. You know the word of God, you know about him, you can read your scripture, but that missing element's not there. That I am being indwelt and filled with God through the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. There's a difference. There's a difference. I know when God's not talking to me, and it scares me. I know some of you have to have had moments where you feel like, man, I do not feel connected. There's a reason why you don't feel connected. You shut down your source. And God is trying to get your attention because everything you do that's going to have any value in life has to come through him, through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, and out of you. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their mind and conscience are defiled. They don't even know they don't know. Because you can only understand spiritual truth through the work of Christ, the Holy Spirit within you, God the Father. They don't even know that they are not thinking right. They literally don't recognize the insanity of their thinking. That just blows my mind. But I've watched in my own life moments where I've been given great understanding about a lot of things, and I quench the Spirit, and I don't even know I'm thinking wrong. Because I'm not thinking in line with what the Word of God tells me. I'm just thinking. And it's amazing to me how deceived you can be into thinking, well, I'm saved, so everything's okay. No, you're saved. There's no question about that. But you very well may be destroying your own life by not letting the Holy Spirit tell you what to think and what to do. That's, that's a fact. I'll wrap up because I know you're all getting burnt out. They profess to know God, but their deeds deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. I didn't say it, your scripture says it. And the question you have to ask yourself, what motivates me to do the things I do in the name of God? Because either they really are from him or they're just talk. What motivates you to live your life It's either to serve him or it's to serve someone else or something else or yourself. We all struggle with that. But my suggestion to us as a group of people, all of us, take the time to think about where you actually are in committing your life to Christ. How committed is it? Is it number one on your list? Number two, three, four? Or does it fall on your list? If it's not number one, You need to do some work. That's enough. Let's pray. I know that all things you say, Lord, to us is for our good. I pray that in this message that you gave us today, that we would be more motivated to take you seriously. I pray that you heal whatever needs to be healed spiritually in the lives of the people that are part of this church. I pray that you would keep working on the leadership and developing and training them to really lead as ambassadors of you, not just run a church. I pray, Lord, that you teach us and train us to make disciples correctly. And again, as always, thank you for the immense amount of blessing you've given this group of people, the fact that you've taken care of us so well. 
I end this prayer by saying I pray that you are glorified in the lives of each and every one of us and that we learn obedience. And I ask this according to your will. Amen. You're free to go. Come back for your beating next week.